Hi, geometry students. Welcome back to the end of chapter eight, trigonometry. So everything we've done in chapter eight, Sokotoa, angles of depression and elevation, Pythag, they're all with right triangles, right? Well, we've got this little fail-safe oh. section at the end of chapter eight, section eight, six. We're going to do this in two days, but it's the law of sines and the law of cosines. So here's the thing. The law of sines is used to solve non-right triangles. Notice in the example that I have over on the right, A, B, and C, is nothing is marked as a right angle. So everything we've done in this whole chapter has been right triangles. This is what happens when we don't have a right triangle. So we can use any two parts of the proportion. I'm going to put the proportion in that box down below. And we set up a proportion. Everybody knows how to solve a proportion, right? Cross multiply. Only it's just going to have signs in it instead of numbers or expressions or whatever it might be. I'm going to be super strict. I want to see your paper and pencil math before you go to your calculator. I don't want to see any rounded decimals. I don't want to see anything like that. I want to see what you're going to type into your calculator as your very last step. So calculation is the last thing you do, paper and pencil math first. And here's the thing about this. You will always be given three pieces of information. So non-right, three pieces of information. Here's what the law of signs looks like. We could set up a proportion with the sine of angle A over side A, the sine of angle B over side B, and the sine of angle C over side C. Remember up here, I put, we don't ever have an equation with three sides, right? So we're going to use any two parts of the proportion, whatever works for our particular situation. Everybody knows at this point, capital letters are for points which are vertexes, vertices on our triangles. Small letters are for sides. Side A is always opposite angle A. So anytime you see that, it will always be set up that way. So let's do an example. Not a lot to talk about here, but let's do an example so that you can see exactly what we're talking about. I used ABC, but we could have a triangle PQR, right? So maybe I have 27 degrees, and I know that this side is 15, and then I know that uh, angle B is 35 degrees, and this is what I'm looking for. So I'm going to set myself up a proportion. I happen to have angle A and angle B, so I would just use these two parts. And I'm going to do the sine of 27 over 15 equals the sine of 35 over x. And then I've got myself an equation to cross multiply and solve. So it's, it's an easy pattern once you see it. So example one says to find p round sides to the nearest tenth. So small p, remember, is opposite capital P. So I can put a p here or an x or whatever you prefer. Notice I'm given three pieces of information. And it's not ABC, but if we know what that pattern is, we can do the sine of an angle over its opposite side equals the sine of an angle over its opposite side. Q, angle Q and side Q don't have any bearing here. So I would set up a sine of 17 degrees over its opposite side, P, that's what we don't know, equals the sine of 29 over its opposite side, 8. Once we've got that set up, right, that's just a proportion. It looks busier than what we're accustomed to, but we're still going to cross multiply. I always like to do the cross multiplying with the variable on the left. So I'm going to write P times the sine of 29 equals 8 times the sine of 17. Notice I always put that number first because if I wrote it like this, sine of 17 times 8. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here. Am I supposed to do 17 times 8 first? Is that a decimal? I don't know what's going on. So always put your number first. So 8 
times the sine of 17. Okay, so go back. This is an algebra problem. We want to get the p by itself, right? And we're multiplying the p times the sine of 29. Well, what's the inverse operation for multiplying by a sine of 29? We're going to divide by a sine of 29. That will make those guys cancel out. If I divide by a sine of 29 on the left, I have to do so on the right. So, paper and pencil math first, right? P is going to equal 8 times the sine of 17. And then I'm going to divide by the sine of 29. There's my paper and pencil math. When I do this problem, I'm going to end up with P is approximately... Uh, I ended up with a 4.8. I'm going to round to the nearest tenth. Let me just look at what that looks like. Make sure you try the calculator part of it. Don't just believe me because what happens if you can't um, make that work on your own, right? So when I did this problem, I ended up with a 4.824. 8, 2, 4, 5, blah, 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 blah. One number after the decimal, so the 2 tells me to stay where I'm at. Don't go up. So we've got ourselves a 4.8 is the approximate length of side P. So let's see what else we've got here. So you know we always have problems then where we can look for an angle. Let's do one more of these. Let's do example 2. Find B, round to the nearest tenth. We know that, right? So here's B. B is on the opposite side of the 68. Now here's something that I probably should have done just to keep you thinking. Instead of putting that 37 in there, maybe I should have taken that out and put in a 75 here instead. Because then for one minute you might be confused but not, right? We don't know, if we know that angle C is 75, but we don't know its opposite side. So that's not going to help us with a proportion. However, we do know C, or sorry, um, side A is 3. And that would be really helpful if we knew that opposite angle. Well, go back a couple few chapters, triangle sum theorem, right? If we know we've got a 68 and a 75, we could absolutely figure out what that other angle is. We add, add those two together, subtract from 180, we get a 37. So I should have done that just to keep you on your toes, but I've got everything that I need to set up here. So I know that my sine of 37 is across from the 3. I know that my sine of 68 is across from the B or the X or whatever variable you want to use. Paper and pencil math first, please and thank you. So this one I'm going to do B times the sine of 37 equals 3 times the sine of 68. In order to get this B by itself, I'm going to have to divide by the sine of 37. It's fancy, but it's still algebra, right? It's still inverse operations getting rid of those. So when you go to your calculator, you're going to type in 3 times the sine of 68, divide that by the sine of 37. And if I'm rounding to the nearest tenth, I ended up with side B was approximately 4.6. There it is. Law of sines, easy, right? Just setting up that proportion, looking to see what angle and side are opposite, what pairs up. So let's do example three because example three is a little different. It, first of all, does not have a diagram. So find the measure of angle Z. Notice we're finding an angle. That's different. To the nearest degree in triangle XYZ if, so I better draw this, right? Doesn't matter what it looks like, XYZ, which means we know where the opposite, si or opposite side is the small letter. So it says Y is equal to 17. That's a small Y. So this is 17. Side Z is equal to 14. The measure of angle Y is 92. And the question itself asked us to find the measure of angle Z. So I'm going to put an X in angle Z. So still, we don't know if it's a right triangle. We still have three pieces of information, and we're still going to set up that proportion, the sine of an angle over its opposite side. So I could do the sine of X 
over 14. Looks a little bit different than those last two problems we just did, but we know how to do this. We just got to put it all together. Sine of 92 over 17. Paper and pencil math first. Do not be intimidated. I'm always going to cross multiply the side that has the variable on it just because I like that on the left because I'm picky like that. So I'm going to do 17 times the sine of x equals 14 times the sine of 92. Well, think inverse operations. I'm trying to get this x by itself. So this is actually two steps. The first thing I need to do is get rid of that 17. So getting rid of that 17, I'll just divide by 17. So I'm left with sine of x equals 14 times the sine of 92, all divided by 17. So um, from there, how do you separate an x from a sine? We did this earlier in this chapter, right? We spent 8, 4, C solving for a ver uh, angle, separating an x from a sine. We do the inverse operation still. Well, the inverse of sining is that, remember, inverse sine or sine to the negative 1, inverse sine. So when you go to your calculator, I usually do this whole big inside thing first. I'll do 14 times the sine of 92, divide that by 17, I get that answer, and then I'm going to do inverse sine the answer. So inverse sine, everybody has an ANS answer button on your calculator, whether you realize it or not. That should be there. We are going to round to the nearest degree. We always round angles to the nearest whole, sides to the nearest tenth. So when I inverse signed that answer, I know that I had to round it, but I got x was about 55 degrees. Tricky one because x is a angle. And I remember talking about that back in section 8.4. You use the inverse sign when you are looking for an angle. You just do the problem if you're looking for a side. So nothing has changed there. That is it for section 8.4a, sorry, 8.6a. I'll see you back here for 8.6b, the last section, Law of Cosines. Have a great day.